And they would baptize them saying, now, now you can obey the gospel. Get baptized. Now you're following Jesus. Now you're repenting. So let's baptize you. Yeah. And people will call them Anabaptists um, because they were they were baptizing again. Anabaptist means to rebaptize. Mm-hmm. And they rejected that because they were saying, we're not rebaptizing. The first one wasn't even legit. That was just a thing that you do. Because I'd be worried about your soul. Why you still be doubting you got a soul? Like you need to see to believe these things. But you believe things that you've never seen. Like feelings and hopes and dreams. The future emotions and gravity. And sadly, everything you're rejecting makes this whole life a tragedy. Welcome to the Milk and Meat Podcast. I'm Andrew and I have my brother with me. Hello. And he's giving the intro. <laughs> just like that. There it is. No, yeah. <laughs> Uh, no, yeah, we're going to be talking about uh, different denominations, yeah. um, and we're going to be actually s- uh, bouncing off of a video that we saw recently mm-hmm. on, uh, and I can't remember his name, what was it? The- uh, Redeemed Zoomer. Yeah, Redeemed Zoomer. Yeah, he where- gave us the thumbs up. Yeah. Oh, yeah, that's right. You contacted him. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, basically, he has this wonderful video where he breaks down all the different denominations, Christian denominations. And, uh, and he does a very good job. He's very, uh, thorough for the short time that he did it. Cause I think it was like, what, 12 minutes, 12 and some change. Yeah. Yeah. So we want to actually bounce off of that uh, video. So what we're going to do is we're going to play the video, pause and, and, you know, expand on some of the points. Cause although he was very good uh, about it, uh, we could definitely cover in much broader detail, uh, some of the different denominations and, uh, the purpose that I hope uh, in this uh, episode and in the episodes to come, uh, the idea I kind of had was, uh, where should I go to church, right? Because yeah. there's a lot of people that have asked me or just that I've heard, uh, they're like, so what's the right church to go to, mm-hmm. you know? Because uh, there's always the, you know, Christianity, it's an umbrella term for like the Catholics, uh, the 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 Orthodox Church, the Jehovah's Witness, the Mormons, like people think Christian, they think anybody that has a Bible. Or says the name Jesus. Yeah, or says the name Jesus. Um, So we want to clarify a real doctrine and attach that to denominations Mm -hmm. um, and churches. And hopefully that'll help somebody who is wondering, so what is the right church to go to? Or who is, is wondering about the church that they are going to? Uh, or who is new to faith and are looking for a church. I hope to clear up some of those questions and some of those uh, just, just, or even if they just have the, they're wondering. Yeah. Um, so yeah, uh, this is uh, the series. It just, where should we go to church? And this will be the first episode to kind of like kick that off mm-hmm. and go into the video. Cause again, it was a very good video. Uh, we're going to break it down here, but you could feel free to watch that video on your own. Mm-hmm. I'm pretty sure we'll put a link somewhere. Um, but yeah. All right. So mm-hmm. yeah, uh, we're gonna, we'll just start off with, uh, defining terms. Uh, a denomination, um, it technically means like of the name. Mm-hmm. So anyone that goes to a church with a denomination, um, they're, they're associating that congregation with the theology that falls under that name. So which kind of a church do you go to? I go to a Baptist. So there's an idea of what that Baptist church, right. even if it's like, and there's, you know, there's, there's kind of leeway. There's a left kind of leaning, right leaning. I'm yeah. not saying like politically necessarily, but they, they sway and go mm-hmm. either further or, or in a more shallow way sp- uh, concerning specific aspects right. to theology or doctrines. However, there is a general consensus on what a Baptist church Right practices or how it handles scripture, how it handles the church, the Christian life, the beliefs about salvation, about all those things. So denomination literally means pertaining to the name. Mm -hmm. And in an ecclesiastical sense, denominating is defining a church uh, which connects to a specific theological leaning or theological views. Um, I want to start by saying, technically, if we didn't have a bunch of, I don't know, opinionated people in this world, which we do, right. uh, there, there wouldn't be like denominations. Mm-hmm. Um, it, it seems to violate what, uh, what I understand, um, from scripture. So for example, first Corinthians one ten says this, it says, now I exhort you brethren by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you all agree and that there be no divisions among you 
but that you be made complete in the same mind and in the same judgment. That seems fairly clear that the point is to be united in the faith right. um, in such a way that there aren't noticeable divisions. Now there's going to be cultural distinctions. Right. You can't change that. You're not going to go into a... The point is not to go in and to completely con- colonize every area you bring right. in Christ into. Mm-hmm. You bring the gospel, and within their culture, they'll ad- when, when it comes in and they receive the gospel, they believe right. it, they will begin to follow after God. That doesn't yeah. mean that now they can't have their cultural dress. That doesn't mean that yeah. now they have to have a whole different theme right. of that. It, it, it's like yeah, Christianity is going to look different sometimes in those in those ways. Yeah, and I think you know people need to realize that you know mm-hmm. uh, people are splitting hairs over dress code. You know what I mean? Yeah. Where the actual uh, important aspect of Christianity is that we believe in Christ and we follow after Christ and we live a life according to that um, through his, uh, you know, him, him uh, uh, living in us and, and, and allowing or not allowing, uh, em- empowering us to do so, um, giving us the strength. Um, that's the important part. But people, they do, they make whole denominations off of dress code, yeah. off of how your hair should be uh, off of uh, how you should even go and uh, tell somebody about Christ. Yeah. Cause I can remember years ago, um, uh, somebody, you know, I, I was in the neighborhood with some kids and just out of nowhere, they asked about like, uh, I think it was like the Virgin Mary. Yeah. And I was, I was like in middle school or high school and I was able to tell them like, no, the Virgin, Virgin Mary is not somebody that you you turn to and it, and that was in my min- limited knowledge and i know that it was god empowering me through that but i was able to explain to them and and sort of go into the gospel with a bunch of other kids um and i was in a tank top and some shorts and some sandals yeah. when that happened and then i was so excited i got home and then my mom was like oh what were you doing i was like oh i you know i was explaining to my friends about god and blah blah, blah. And she's like in a tank top and some sandals and some yeah. shorts i'm like well, yeah. She's like, no, you got to wear a tie and be presentable when you're presenting the guy. It's like little things like that, that can actually create a whole other church or denomination. Yeah. Um, so yeah, people need to understand that the importance is the gospel. Mm-hmm. Can we agree on the gospel? Yes. You're a brother. You're a believer. You might have uh, different preferences, you mm-hmm. know, in style and uh, way you preach or teach. But as if the central thing is Christ, then then we're good. We can we can be brothers. Mm-hmm. Yeah, mm-hmm. the biblical Christ. Right, the biblical so, Christ. Yeah. Um, however, there is there is an aspect where even Paul, because uh, we know Paul wrote uh, at least a good 12, portion. What is that? At least twelve of the yeah. New Testament epistles. Uh, but in First Corinthians eleven eighteen to nineteen, he goes on to say, uh, for in the first place, when you come together. As a church, now again, this is within the same letter, it's a rebuke, entire letter is a full rebuke. Uh, When you come together as a church, I hear that divisions exist among you, and in part, I believe it. For there must also be factions among you, so that those who are approved may become evident among you. So he's pointing out the fact that they have a a, uh, divisions as in like little cliques and groups, like those within favorites and 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 he's pointing to that kind of division in these aspects um but also referring to the fact that there should be a distinction between those that are walking in faithful piety um those that are actually persevering in the faith those that are actually growing in the christian graces there should be a noticeable distinction between those mm-hmm. that are walking it with with less with less stumbling in sin Mm -hmm. uh, than those that are just careless or sometimes more ignorant Mm -hmm. of the basics. Um, So there should be that because then you'd have the ability to kind of sharpen one another. You'd have the Mm -hmm. ability to edify others because you know there's a need or people know who to go to for Mm -hmm. help with prayer, for help with studying, for help in theology. There should be that sort of division, but it shouldn't be like the bickering kind. Right. It shouldn't be that. So Paul was kind of referring to that 
So there's two words that are used in verse 18. Verse 18, uh, where it says, I hear that there's divisions, that's the word for um, schisma. Schisma means I heard that there's a divisions or, or a split, and that's with the, within the people. But verse 19 um, says the word for heresy, meaning uh, there must be factions among you. Now, mm-hmm. heresy has two uses uh, among the I guess among the church right the most common one is the one that actually means an opinion that is opposed to the word of God to the re- revelation of scripture to the standard of Christ a heresy is something that teaches against or opposed to or different from what the Bible says but the actual definition of heresy literally just means an opinion um, or a, or a choice. Mm-hmm. So within church, you'll hear heresy, and you'll automatically connect that to something that is opposed to the Bible, something that's wrong. Right. But in this in this one here, it, it, he uses the word for heresy in verse nineteen, where he says, "For for there must also be factions among you, so that those who are approved may become evident among you." So faction the word there is actually for heresy so he's using it in a favorable sense but if we look at acts uh where is it? if we look at acts five seventeen, mm-hmm. uh it talks about the the word is still heresies it talks about the heresy of the sadducees um the sect of the sadducees acts fifteen five. the sect of the pharisees so different sects different opinions the sadducees had one belief the pharisees had another the pharisees had the Talmud, they were always being super nitpicky, adding right. adding commandments of man as if they were, or teachings of men as if they were commandments of God. Sadducees, were they the ones that didn't believe in the resurrection? Yeah. There, there was a group that didn't even believe that mm-hmm. there's life after death. They just thought you die, you die. So when Jesus spoke about in, the resurrection. In, in the Jewish, uh, yeah. uh, oh, yeah, so I, some, I was not aware of that. So, but... Um, Acts 15, 5 says, uh, but some of the sect of the Pharisees who had believed stood up saying, it is necessary to circumcise them to, and to direct them to observe the law of Moses. So this was the group uh, that believed, and then the Jews came from James, and they started kind of saying, hey, you guys can't really be Christians yet. you got to first become Jews. And then they complained, saying, we got to get circumcised. And then they sent Paul, mm-hmm. and then Paul showed like, hey, this is this is... This is what the scripture says. And yeah. they finally said, okay, fine. Just avoid uh, idols and meet, uh, meet, what is it? Meat sacrifice to idols, uh, sexual immorality, and avoid the blood. Mm-hmm. So don't eat like medium rare. Yeah. So they were just like, don't, don't press on the conscience of the Jews around you who are coming to Christ because they take that super seriously. Mm-hmm. Not saying that, you know, oh, if they're cool with it, you can perform sexual immorality. But he's right. saying like major things that we have to make sure do that and paul said well we were going to do that anyway Mm -hmm. we were going to avoid those things anyway um so i guess it's important to understand that that the divisions the distinctions um there was a favorable way of looking at it Mm -hmm. where there should be a realization of who's actually faithful who's actually not who's complacent who's active in the faith who's really Mm -hmm. working their salvation out fear and trembling uh and those that are being kind of negligent right but as far as the doctrine as far as the faith there should never be divisions. Mm-hmm. It should always be the same gospel, the same faith. Right. And there's always that emphasis made in Scripture. I think the the main thing, aside from Christ and the gospel, is always being pointed out by Paul is divisions, mm-hmm. factions, favoritism. And it's like, it's as if that's a constant ongoing theme in, in all the epistles right. for the most part. Uh, even, in, uh, even in Philippians, Mm-hmm. I mean, that's considered a faithful church. They're doing it all right. There was right. no rebuke there, really. But there was a pleading saying, don't let, their, don't let anything come in between you and the gospel. Don't let anything come and corrupt you. Uh, it's, it's wonderful to see that y- you can get a praise from Paul. Right. Like, you don't have to be a complete mess like the Corinthians. <laughs> I mean, Philippians had a pretty positive yeah. outcome. But the warning is very strong. Yeah, you know, uh, absolutely. Because, I mean, that's what we see today. Uh, we have a lot of cults out there that are using the name of Christ yeah. uh, to further their goals and their agenda. Um, so definitely the warning is very real, uh, you, you know, especially for us nowadays. Uh, so it's important to know and understand what the gospel really is. Yeah. And then, you know, 
and then, then again, that's where we can all connect as fellow believers. Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Um, so we're going to get into the video, uh, mm -hmm. just so that we point out that we're allowed to use it flashing that on the screen, even though you got the okay already, <laughs> I got the okay, but <laughs> some people might look at it and not realize that, yeah. um, you, you have the right to fair use. You mm -hmm. have the right to use stuff or commentary for criticism. Otherwise, news stories would never be able to happen. You couldn't use anyone's right. content. Uh, but we have, the, we have the right to use it. And we will start with this video. We'll just be pausing throughout mm -hmm. it. And hopefully it doesn't get annoying. Mm -hmm. but, uh, but I think we'll be able to kind of give some additional detail. Because yeah. uh, the Redeem Zoomer um, did a great job. But we want to specify some things mm -hmm. uh, because we know that we could mm -hmm. and it might be more beneficial as well. Yeah. So we'll go for that. There's so many different forms of Christianity, so how do we tell them apart, aside from like stereotypes that may or may not be true? To put it simply, they're all called Christian because they all worship Christ. They all agree who Jesus Christ is. He's truly human and truly God, he was born of the Virgin Mary, he died for our sins, he rose from the dead, he ascended into heaven and will return to judge the living and the dead. Okay, so we know that those are some of the pertinent uh, fundamentals of Christianity. Mm -hmm. Even though some that say that, they really do follow and practice after an entirely different right. thing uh, that doesn't look anything like true biblical Christianity. Mm -hmm. um, however, those are... Those are some of the main distinctions. Mm -hmm. If someone says, I'm a Christian, it's like, well, do you, what do you believe about Christ? And, and how are you saved? Those are some of the important questions. And if they mm -hmm. say something wild, like, you know, Jesus didn't really come. It was just, you know, it was a mirage. It's like, oh, okay. So, yeah. so you're falling in the stuff that John mm -hmm. rebuked. Um, you're falling in line with those heresies. Yeah. And uh, we never know what, uh, what that, could, that could lead to. But yeah. These are the essentials of Christianity, which are contained in the Nicene Creed, the early church document that all these different churches use. So they're similar in that they're all Christian, but they still have a lot of differences. Okay, so I'd like to just go to the Nicene Creed real quick. Yeah. Because I think it would be good to just read it so people know what, what it really refers to. Um, the Nicene Creed goes as such... It says, we believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, begotten from the Father before all ages, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of the same essence as the Father. Through him, all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven. He became incarnate by the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary and was made human. He was crucified for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried. The third day he rose again, according to the scriptures. He ascended to heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again with glory to judge the living and the dead. His kingdom will never end. And we believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life. He proceeds from the Father and the Son, and with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified. He spoke through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. Catholic does not mean Roman Catholic. It right. means united church. We affirm one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look forward to the resurrection of of the dead and to life in the world to come amen so that's the nicene creed mm -hmm. um there's well, we'll actually explain what actually happened as far as the great schism mm -hmm. um but what was it 1054 ad the great schism i think it was mm, yeah 1054 ad uh we'll go into that as well uh, that pertains to the Nicene Creed and among other things, mm -hmm. but, but yeah, that's uh that's one of the main creeds, and that that isn't to step over scripture, that isn't to like right. change scripture and say this is now scripture. It's a it's to say like this is what we get from scripture. Yeah, mm -hmm. it's it's a basic declaration because there were so many people that were wondering what 
what's going on with Father, Son, and Spirit? How mm-hmm. do you understand God's nature? The yeah. Trinity is weird. We don't understand it. Uh, more than one God. Uh, people didn't understand it. So the main aspects of God's work in salvation are kind of highlighted in this statement, this creedal statement. And if people wouldn't align to it, they would be considered non-Christian. Um, now I wish we would use the creeds for our people, but mm-hmm. people have gone away from creeds because they feel like they want to just kind of do their own thing. Right. Um, we see that as well. Or they don't want to like tell people what to what to believe in such a strict way. Mm-hmm. But I, I personally have disagreements with that. Well, we're going to get into the dangers <laughs> of that for sure. Yeah, so let's continue. Let's start with the Baptists. There's a lot that makes Baptists unique, but the main thing is baptism. Wait, no, not like that. Like that, yeah, they don't baptize babies, because they think baptism is a personal and individual choice. Most other Christians say baptism is what makes you Christian, but they think baptism is how you proclaim that you've already become Christian, by having a personal born-again experience, where you go from not Christian to Christian. So they're very individualistic, which is why they're most common in the southern United States, and it's all about a personal relationship for them. So that means the church itself and its religious rituals matter a lot less than having a personal relationship with Jesus. And the religious rituals the church does do, like the Lord's Supper, are really just symbolic. This is called being low church, where the church as an institution doesn't really matter that much. So because the church is really just a fellowship of individual believers, it doesn't really matter how the church is structured as long as they're following the Bible. So that means most independent or non-denominational churches are really just Baptist in terms of their beliefs. Yeah, so that's low church. And it- okay, so in in essence, yes, mm-hmm. the, the, there's there's facts uh, in that. Um, I think there's a real grazing over some of it, so we'll just right. di- uh, dive into some of the details. Um, the Baptist denomination, you could say, uh, traces its, its roots back to 16th century Anabaptists, and Anabaptist was a name... Um, given to them um, because they would baptize ag- again. Now, look, we, we know that uh, in 16th century we had the Reformation. However, before that, uh, Roman Catholicism was the ruling power, and right. they would baptize infants. And the issue with that was people would you know be baptized as infants, be given this promise, and then they're living this heathen life. Mm-hmm. They're, they're just doing the basics, but they just depart from the faith depart from the external visible faith. Right. And, and they'd still be told, like, you know, just come back, do the confession, and you're good, or stuff like that. Things you, you see in Roman Catholicism now, you could live a pagan life, come back for confessional, your sins are forgiven. Mm-hmm. And then you go back to your pagan life, just keep coming back, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, whatever days you choose, the right. better off you'll be. Um, the more you practice, the better your eternity will be. Right. Um, as if you're really earning towards salvation mm-hmm. instead of actually growing in the graces of God and building up an outcome for the labors that you've performed in Christ. It's more of like earning your salvation. So it's it's a completely opposite view of what the Bible teaches. But they were called the Anabaptists, and it was so severe that they were actually threatened because they began to baptize people that later on would come to a confessing faith. Mm. And they would baptize them saying, now, now you can obey the gospel get baptized. Now you're following Jesus. Now you're repenting. So let's baptize you. Yeah. And people will call them Anabaptists um, because they were they were baptizing again. Anabaptist means to rebaptize. Mm-hmm. And they rejected that because they were saying, we're not rebaptizing. The first one wasn't even legit. That was just a thing that you do. Because right. um, they didn't see in scripture where there's a command to baptize children specifically. So mm-hmm. they said, okay, I don't see the command for children specifically. We see someone being told to repent and be baptized. We see the household, but we're never specifically said, uh, told a child or baby was baptized. So right. because of that, their emphasis is against infant baptism um, because they, like you said, it's about turning to Christ and coming to saving faith, and then you get baptized. So yeah, it's believers baptized. that you are. Yeah. You have come to faith. So it's interesting because when you look at it, the Anabaptist history is actually crazy. Like they were threatened. Like mm-hmm. they were literally threatened with death if they would continue to re-baptize. That's yeah. wild. So well, uh, yeah, you they, gotta, they split because of that. Yeah, you got to, you know, remember the Catholic Church had all sorts of authority in yeah. government and with the people. 
So they, they had the authority to say, stop that or we'll yeah, kill you. Exactly. And they did. They or, did. or, um, you know, uh, say Christ is Lord mm-hmm. or die. Yeah. <laughs> no. And then they'll say Christ is Lord. It's like, all right, cool. You're a Christian now. It's yeah. like, no, you're not. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you just you're really, yeah. yeah. Like you're really creating hypocrisy when you mm-hmm. do that because you threaten people into the faith. Uh, it's 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 more than hitting someone over the head with a Bible. It's more than yeah. forcing a sermon on someone. It's threatening their life if they don't externally conform. Mm. You're not getting any blessings. Yeah. You might create people that hate God more mm-hmm. because of the way you present it. It's 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 something that we have to be aware of. Yeah. Um, so some of the major emphases for Baptists is the believer's baptism. Um, the emphasis on water baptism, like an actual full-on submersion baptism, mm-hmm. um, soul competence and soul freedom. This is the the focus of the whosoever aspect of John three sixteen. Mm-hmm. Whosoever, because we know that Calvinists uh, aim at you know whosoever. However, there's always that disclaimer saying, but the whosoever's will actually be the ones that are predestined and, and elect from before the foundation of the world. Right. We see scripture saying that. But sometimes the way somebody says something, I, I was talking to David, he was here earlier, I just threw his oh, name nice. in there. Um, but nice. he was he was fixing the piano. Uh, he did a wonderful job, by the way. Yeah. David blessed uh, my wife and fixed the piano in a way that, man, like, yeah. that's crazy. He would definitely and, be a blessing if he was on this episode. Yeah, but you know, yeah, just uh, we have- Throw it out there. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, he was explaining that how you say something, um, can determine the receptivity of it by the other party. And I understand that. Right. I, I know that we've been strong in some aspects on this on this podcast. And right. it's it's probably a good time to step back a little and reevaluate. Absolutely. Um, but um but it's also important to understand that that's the way sometimes even uh, in doctrine. In hell in real biblical doctrine we see the same thing. Some people overly exert yeah. uh their opinion. Uh for example the scripture talks about predestination election from before the foundation of the world. That's there. Forcing someone or making someone have to understand that isn't necessary. Right. Uh, forcing someone to exp- uh, to understand and to be able to comprehend election is not a necessity. Being able to display that it's there and there's a hidden will of God that's involved and he reveals parts of it. There's parts that we didn't understand. How? How are we chosen before the foundation of the world? How does God work that out? You don't Mm -hmm. have to be able to say, I get it. Yeah. Uh, So, so when, when the, uh, when someone is just like Spurgeon said, Spurgeon says something along the lines of, um, and he's a Calvinist. Mm -hmm. So, So he, as a Calvinist, understanding predestination election, I myself line up with, uh, Calvinism, um, he would say, um, if God would put a yellow stripe on the backs of the elect, I'd be walking around lifting shirts. Mm-hmm. And he's speaking about the fact that he'd know who to preach to. Otherwise, if there's no yellow stripe. No, you're not going to be saved. Uh, not, I'm going to try. There's two seconds of my time is a waste. Mm-hmm. But he says, but since he hasn't, then I will say whosoever. That's good. We have to extend the gospel to every single person. Right. Despite knowing that only some will be saved Mm -hmm. despite knowing that god knows who will be saved and god's purpose their salvation in a way that we don't understand Mm -hmm. we're not ever told to limit who we we preach to and reach to or to make it seem like hey you're not coming you're probably not called Mm -hmm. that's foolish yeah because you don't know what's gonna happen in that person's life and you're about to denounce their possibility of salvation because they are not currently responding to your gospel call right like how far did Paul go before Christ called right. him? Mm-hmm. I mean, yeah, he was an apostle. His situation is a little bit different, but at the same time, he was very successful in his Judaism. Mm-hmm. He rejected the gospel. How many times? He was able to probably hear it, hear right. about it, still rejected it, and he yeah. came to, to that. How many testimonies have we heard of like real hardened people? I mean, yeah. shoot, even uh, we've quoted atheists, you know, and mm-hmm. Uh, there's some, there's many atheists that have come to faith. Yeah, you know, it's whosoever. It's, exactly, God is the one that does that. Uh, it's you know, if to us, it might look like you know they 
accepted it. They they changed their mind about their their views. Mm-hmm. Um, that's what it looks like to us. But to God, He's like, I, I've had that plan. Yeah. How that works, I don't know. Do we need to? Like you were saying earlier, do we need to be able to explain that? No. Yeah. We just simply, and we were commanded to uh, give the gospel out to all Absolutely. living creatures. So, mm-hmm. so that's that's why there was this. Uh, even in America, there was this big break between. Uh, free will Baptists or Baptists and Calvinists. Right. There's a history of, of real antagonism towards each other because one would say election and they'd probably handle it wrong. Mm-hmm. Some probably handle it right, but there was a, just a disagreement. But there was that strong emphasis of no, whoever wills. Mm-hmm. I think the right way to explain would be, yes, whoever wills. And God knows who wills. He's working in their hearts, leading them to will. Mm-hmm. Whoever won't, won't. Yeah. So reach out to ever, whoever mm-hmm. wills, just mm-hmm. reach out. Um, yeah. I guess that, that disclaimer that people sometimes put into their sermon saying, you know, hey, if you receive the gospel, if you're not believing right now, you're probably not the call. That's, that's probably yeah. the most unbiblical thing you could yeah. say to somebody. The, the gospel is not supposed to go out with limitations mm-hmm. uh, of that sort. Uh, yeah. So little yeah em- uh, emphasis there i think we, we might have gone a little ahead <laughs> of the video there yeah it's, it's yeah. all right we're, we're still in yeah we're still, <laughs> we're in, still baptist. in baptist yeah. <laughs> so um baptist uh congregations often um they prefer uh covenants over creeds mm-hmm. because creeds give this specific um and and i mean my pastor for example he he understands the creeds and mm-hmm. uh, he's he's very thorough in his understanding he actually goes to to a he actually takes classes from a reformed seminary, uh, oh, reformed university. Nice. So, but he knows, he understands the beliefs, he understands where I stand. But we're able to agree and and keep that uh, that relationship positive. Uh, so, covenants are, uh, in their view, describe the kind of people we want to be uh, to one another and in the world. The covenant, the promise of who we are to. Uh, uh, because of Christ and what we're intended to be. Creeds sort seem to dictate what we must believe. Uh, so Baptists have called themselves sometimes uh, non-creedal. Uh, for example, you'll hear the words, uh, the only creed for me is the Bible, mm-hmm. something like that. Yeah. That's that's the opposition to creeds because they don't want more things coming in, taking authority when they right. think the Bible should have the authority. And I agree in that I, aspect. I was, yeah, I, yeah, I agree. Say, like yeah. the creed doesn't replace the Bible. It should highlight things in the bible but it should not become like oh i got these highlights i don't need the text it's like mm-hmm. these highlights don't make sense if Unless you don't have you the have, text yeah, like exactly. let this point you back that's why personally i love my um my uh reformation heritage books uh mm-hmm. what is it uh my heritage bible the study bible yeah. because it has the creeds the confessions the catechisms um and it has in every single way so much supporting scripture annotated at the bottom of every question, every answer in the catechisms, every creed, every confession, just just paragraphs of verses pointing to where those statements would be found in the Bible. Mm-hmm. That's such it's a healthy helpful. way. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Because I wouldn't want those creeds just for the sake of the creeds. Mm-hmm. Personally, I mean, maybe the, the what was it, the, um, the Nicene Creed mm-hmm. is simple enough with those declarations about the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. However, I really, really want that reference because I wouldn't want that to just be something I'm sitting on. Even uh, even here, the Heidelberg Catechism. B- below, oh, yeah. I have all of the biblical I references. Yeah. And all throughout, it gives those little, little footnotes. That's so healthy because we have to know where's this information mm-hmm. coming from. It's not coming from the pastor, from his own mind and ideas separate from the bible it has to come from the bible and we have to know where in the bible otherwise we're just going to be people that memorize stuff like parrots mm-hmm. and we're not going to be able to defend the faith because all we can do is memorize things yeah. memorize statements it's like theology is the study of god it's not just the memorization of some things he said yeah. it's a study of thorough study and relationship with mm-hmm. god through that study so yeah and that relationship and study is is uh till the end yeah it's, absolutely it's endless uh, so some of the, um, just a few of the churches under the Baptist banner would be Southern Baptist, Independent Baptist, Evangelical Free Baptist, and even Reformed Baptist. So you will still have that. Right. So yeah, that's, let's continue. An example of something more high church would be Anglican or Episcopalian. Episcopal just means they're run by a hierarchy of bishops because the church is very structured. So they try to hold a balance between tradition, reason, and scripture. 
They're very eclectic, meaning they try to take the best parts from various other traditions, and that means they have a lot of diversity of belief. Some Anglicans seem more Catholic, and others seem more Protestant. And a lot of Anglicans see themselves as like a middle way between the two. So it's difficult to understand what Anglicanism really is, but don't worry, they don't understand it either. <laughs> little jab there. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. Um, they were actually the ones that requested for their 39 articles uh, to be refined. And from that uh, was produced the Westminster Confession of Faith which is a huge art, a huge document. It really expounds on mm -hmm. the books in the Bible, why why these are the books that are approved, what the teaching of the Bible is, who is God, uh, how do we handle the church. All, it covers an amazing uh, span of mm -hmm. theology and uh, how to live out practically, what to expect out of the Christian faith. Right. Um, but it's amazing that their request, when they separated, um, they wanted to know, what are we keeping? Um, we've, we've, you know, we've, would, I, would you say, we've, we've anathemized the Pope, but we need to know what are we keeping out of the, our faith. Right. It's not all wrong. Um, some of it has to be right. Uh, so that produced the confession, the Westminster Confession, and then the larger and the shorter catechism. So pretty excellent. But yeah, so Anglicanism still has a very rich tradition, and a lot of the prayers and hymn books that people use come from Anglicanism. In fact, a whole new branch sprung out of the Anglican tradition, the Methodists, or Wesleyans. You know that little triangle the Anglicans have of reason, scripture, and tradition? The Methodists add a fourth point and turn it into a quadrilateral. They add spiritual experience because John Wesley's whole deal was he wanted the Anglican church to be more spiritually active. Fire represents the Holy Spirit, which is why a lot of Methodist logos have fire in them. And of the three persons of the Trinity, Methodist thinking is centered a lot around the Holy Spirit who empowers us on the path, or the method, that leads to righteousness. And we all have free will to join or leave the path. Free will is very important for Methodists. And at the end of the path is entire sanctification, where in this life we can improve so much that we stop sinning completely. And along this path there's a lot of service to the poor and working for justice, as we strive for spiritual perfection. Okay, let's touch on the Methodists real quick. Uh, Methodism began actually as like a mockery, just like the Christians were called Christians in uh, um, Antioch at first. It was kind of like probably used in a mocking term, and they mm -hmm. embraced it, saying, yeah. yeah, we do follow Christ. Uh, Methodism. Methodism was actually yeah. used in that same sort of way. So um, their roots go back to Wesley um, and his brothers and other people. Um, in the 18th century. So the Wesley brothers originated the Holy Club at the University of Oxford, where they were at. And the group would meet uh, weekly and methodot methodically, methodically uh, they set, up, set about how to live a holy life. So they began to kind of like create a little catechism for themselves, in essence, plans and steps to take in order to live a holy life. And that's great. Mm-hmm. Highlight the things that you need to focus on. Pray through those things. Work through those things. Get get scripture memorized in your heart pertaining to those aspects that you're aiming for and that you might be struggling against. Uh, really get the word in your heart. That's the goal. Mm -hmm. um, that should be the aim of a Christian. Like let the word really dwell in your heart richly, so that you can fight against uh, temptation, all the fiery darts of the devil with scripture. Mm -hmm. um, so they began to do that and they aimed to um, grow in their sanctification, grow in their effectiveness in their communities. And uh, they received communion every single week, which I'm not against. I think that, I think in essence, I think that's what you see in the scripture. Right, you see them every single week getting together, every regularly getting together mm -hmm. and breaking bread and that pertained. I think it says to do it often in the yeah, scriptures. As I'm often, well, yeah whenever you gather for this. So mm -hmm. there isn't this limitation. Some churches right. are like super strict once a year. I'm really sad for those. <laughs> I really think that's not enough. Yeah. Um, some churches are every week. I think that might seem like too much. Um, however, maybe if it's handled uh, truly with a close table uh, where those that confess Christ and are not 
in blatant sin Mm -hmm. coming instead of the people saying, Hey, you know, we got juice every Sunday. Like, (laughs) yeah, (laughs) stop. Yeah. (laughs) No, (laughs) only for believers. Like, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Then people would get the wrong idea. Yeah, absolutely. Um, they receive communion every week. Uh, they would abstain from most forms of amusement and luxury, which I'm again, I think that's a great aim. Mm -hmm. I think that's something we can aim a little bit more for because a lot of, um, the American dream kind of ideology yeah. getting into people's minds, like have it all. It's like you can't prosperity gospel. Yeah, you can't have yeah. it all. In fact, you should give up a lot of this world, uh, give up the the aims of this world, and and go for Christ, mm-hmm. and you'll look like a very different person. And they would commonly visit the sick and the poor. Mm-hmm. Uh, the fellowship was mocked and called Methodist because they would have these rules and methods of how to uh, determine their own religious convictions. And uh, John Wesley took the insult and turned it into a an honorary title. Mm-hmm. Um, what Wesley taught was that a person is free not only to reject salvation, but also to accept it by an act of free will. So yeah. entirely of his own free will, like un, I guess you could say untouched by God's sovereignty. A person has the total free will mm-hmm. to do or not to do. Um, all people who are obedient to the gospel according to the measure of knowledge given to them will be saved. I agree. Yes, as uh, whatever you have been revealed in Scripture, uh, if you're obedient to that, I mean, if you have the Bible, you got the whole thing, right? But if for some reason someone lives on an island and all they have is John chapter one, and they come to saving faith, yeah. I don't know what sanctifying graces God is going to work in that person. I mm-hmm. know that He can by the Holy Spirit just does. give you wisdom, give you understanding. I think um, I, I heard a, a testimony of a uh, a woman. She lived in a country where the Bible is banned. And she had, I think, the book of Peter, yeah. like, all around her house, like, because she was hiding it. And a missionary came by and had the whole Bible, and she had been living off of just Peter. Yeah. Like, and she knew it very well, but she was a, a believer. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. And that's wonderful, mm-hmm. like, how people treasure the Bible in other countries, and we just, like, have yeah. them in the hotels. Yeah. Like, cool. No, you don't even, people don't even open those drawers. Mm-hmm. I look at my hotels. Mm-hmm. Whenever I stop by a hotel, I'm like, where is it? And now I see the Book of Mormon there too. I'm like, well, that's new. <laughs> they start adding that in. Yeah. So you got the Bible and the Book of Mormon. I'm like, that. Ah, those two disagree in every way. But mm-hmm. um, but yeah, so all people who are, uh, the Holy Spirit assures a Christian of their salvation directly through an inner experience. Yes. You know, the Holy Spirit gives us conviction, giving us uh, the understand that, you know, crying out, Abba, Father. Mm-hmm. However, um, there are some people that might not understand what that conviction might feel like. They might not, they might be confounded by false teaching to not even be sure. Uh, yeah. We've, we've seen that. We've seen mm-hmm. people that are saved. We're, we're certain they're saved mm-hmm. and they're just anxiously wondering if they're saved. So sometimes false teaching can also mm-hmm. uh, produce a distrust in God. Mm-hmm. I, I really don't like how yeah. that happens at times. Yeah. I think it was it. Um, I just thought of Martin Luther, you know, yeah. before the reformation, he was definitely a very anxious person Yeah, because he, uh, yeah, no matter how many times he would confess, he would forget one thing mm-hmm. and then uh, he'd leave the confessional all like relaxed, like, oh, okay, I'm good. I'm, I'm in good graces now. And then he, on the way home or whatever, he would remember that he forgot to confess one sin yeah. and that all that, that all anxiety yeah, would fall right on him. And, and he said some, I don't want to misquote it, but some along the lines where it got to a point where it seemed like he hated God yeah. because of all that. Yeah. Well, he directly said he hated God. Ah, okay. Yeah. So, all right. I was enough. I was like, I knew he, he said it somewhere. He's like, love God. I hate God. Yeah. So that that's what God seemed like to him, an unbearable burden. Mm-hmm. Now, the law should have that burden on us until it brings us to Christ. Mm-hmm. Law is a schoolmaster. The commandments of God are a schoolmaster to bring us to Christ. The mm-hmm. Ten Commandments should show us we're not able should lead us to repentance. Instead, people try to like see like, well, I got four out of 10. Pretty good. Like, yeah. no, <laughs> that's not that's not yeah. how you view that mm-hmm. at all. Um, and also um, the belief that Wesley uh, followed after, and I don't know if he created it, but uh, he had the, the idea that uh, Christians in this life are capable of Christian perfection and are commanded by God to pursue it. No, <laughs> uh, be perfect as I, as your heavenly father is perfect, uh, doesn't mean be errorless. It was a section of scripture where, uh, Jesus was speaking in Matthew talking about love. It was a sermon on the Mount talking about, you know, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. 
Um, God sends the rain to the just and the unjust. Be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. So just as God is good and providential to the good and the evil, um, so you should be forgiving and loving and outgoing to the good and the evil. Be perfect. Be entire. Be whole. Don't be partial in your love. Don't be nicer to these people than to those. Be good and graceful and merciful to all. That's that perfection he's talking about. Mm-hmm. Uh, he, he, it would be weird to tell someone like, hey, man, so we know God is like perfect. Be that. Yeah. <laughs> Come on now. Put an unreachable burden on somebody. And then what are you going to do with, uh, what is it, Matthew 12, uh, where Jesus said, you know, is it Matthew 12? Jesus said, come unto me uh, and I will give you rest. My burden mm-hmm. is light. My yoke is easy. You'll find rest for your souls. How do you how do you put that in there if you also tell them, but be perfect? Like God, yeah. Rest from your trials. Rest from your burden of being perfect, but then be perfect again. Mm-hmm. No, that's that doesn't line up at all Mm -hmm. it seems like wesley also might have coined the term agree to disagree because Mm -hmm. he would have these um these disagreements and these heated debates sometimes uh and even with george whitfield and and he would be able and willing to at the end of it realize that they're still believers they're christians uh he was more strict about these things wesley um uh george whitfield wasn't as strict on those things like that kind of that attitude with which he took it the methods Mm -hmm. um and he'd be able to to say at the end of some of those debates like agree to disagree and it seems like in his writings that was some of the first times you see that in Mm -hmm. in literature it seems like he might actually that's really cool because i don't know what was that a few hundred years ago and we're still using it today that's pretty cool absolutely but yeah and that's that's where i think that that can be healthy though to agree to disagree Mm -hmm. on you know on like the minor non-essential issues yeah the non-essential issues um I wonder if we'll ever cover that chart that we, we do from the Do Theology <laughs> podcast. We got to. Because that, that really... It's a good one. Yeah, it really explains it well. But yeah, it's it's those things where, again, I think we said it in the beginning of this episode, where do we agree on the, the main things, mm-hmm. on the, the you know, uh, Christ being God, he died, he resurrected for our sins, and he's coming back, and like the essentials, if you agree mm-hmm. on that, cool. Like the other uh, methods, um, as long as they... Uh, agree with scripture and it's not going a completely different mm-hmm. way like the catholics where it's like you got to do 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 or not yeah. just the catholics but there's many denominations where it's like you got to work you got to work to get there you got to work to get there as long as it's not like mm-hmm. the jewish talmud like the extra uh-huh. things that the pharisees had a whole right. additional set of rules it's like it was apparently intended to give an in to make specific statements about how to pursue the holiness uh and the faithfulness to god and yet it became the standard that you had to reach now right so you had to do these like special additional washings and mm-hmm. practice all these other things like and then people so were being held laws, to yeah. that and mm-hmm. it's like no you can't add to god's commands and claim it to be god's commands you can't mm-hmm. you can't make a commentary on scripture and now say now you have to follow that commentary it's like no that commentary is a commentary Mm-hmm. It's an opinion added to or to explain scripture. You can't take the opinion and now say, because it's about scripture, now that's the opinion and you have to understand that opinion that way. It's like, no, the scripture, that's the standard. Mm-hmm. And the commentary could be correct, but you can't just add it to scripture. You can't add it to that level. So the Methodists, I don't know when they started doing this weird stuff. Yeah, when they doing. just went off the rails. I don't know. Uh, but they do have that quadrilateral, just like uh, just like uh, Redeem Zoomer. I mean, should probably get his name one day. But um, <laughs> just like he mentioned, that they had that uh, that that triangle and mm-hmm. turned it into a quadrilateral. So now they have scripture, tradition, reason, and experience. It's very important that they experience, and uh, and they just added that in. That was an emphasis that they have. But according to resourceumc.org, that's their method, that's their own website. Uh, United Methodists believe in actualizing their faith in community. Actions speak louder than words. And this is uh, their their quote. The three simple rules are do no harm, do good, stay in love with God. Kind of simple in that aspect. Uh, but what, what you do with it, you know, the do no harm becomes something different. And I'll, we'll kind of go into what, what, what it looks like. The do no harm uh, becomes strange and now there's an inclusivity mm-hmm. in methodism right. that wasn't there that it's not bible based um so 
according to Methodist.org, the Methodist Church affirms and celebrates the participation and ministry of its LGBT plus members. So they have empowerment, prevention, and partnership. Empowerment says, we believe all individuals are made in the image of God, whom many call the divine. Pause. <laughs> what? <Yeah. laughs> what are we talking about here? What? Why does that have to even be said that way? Mm -hmm. That sounds like an Oprah Winfrey straight statement. Like, oh, you call him Jesus, I call him the light. Oprah, you're not a Christian. Mm -hmm. You oppose Christianity in every way. The preachers you bring on your shows are unchristian. They're yeah. not real pastors. Um, so some call the divine. You don't see that in scripture. No, you don't. <laughs> so they're trying to include all the mysticism and all that mm -hmm. stuff because they call it the divine. And... Uh, and should be free to live a life of dignity consistent with their sexuality and gender identity within their faith communities without fear or judgment. So yeah. now the LGBTQ should never have any judgment brought toward them mm -hmm. concerning their anti-God lifestyle. Right. But Matthew 18 talks about... Um, if a brother is caught in a trespass, you know, deal with them one on one. If mm -hmm. they refuse to listen, bring an bring a witness, bring two more. And if they don't listen to them either, then tell it to the church. And if not, then like there's there's that accountability where we're yeah. supposed to be able to come to people that confess and state that they are under the banner of Christ and to say, Hey, you're you're sinning, brother. Mm -hmm. And they'll say, Oh man, like if, if you won him over and they repent, good, you got your brother back. Right. But if not there's that that binding and loosing like mm -hmm. it's it's a it's a jewish term referring to the fact that uh, what you bind it's, it's like it's an agreement mm -hmm. that 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 is really still the case like if they're still under sin you're able to say hey you're still bound in your sin right you know, well like you do not repent heaven declares that an unrepentant person doesn't have forgiveness so you can't walk away saying oh liberty in christ no, you're still bound in your sin, brother. Right. I, I, heaven declares it. I'm proclaiming it. You are still bound. You didn't repent. Mm -hmm. Or if they do repent, heaven declares it. The mm -hmm. word says it. Jesus taught it. You're forgiven. You're forgiven of that sin. It's dealt with. You don't have to walk and be like all like morose and negative in church. Not like, oh man, I got caught in sin. It got brought up to me. I repented, but now I feel like dirt. Mm -hmm. Stop feeling like dirt. Yeah. You know, repent, turn to Christ. You're forgiven. Get refreshed, renewed. You're fully in the congregation. Mm -hmm. If you can't come to a brother and say you're in sin, because they're looking at it as judgment, yeah, you can't be the church. You can't do what God says to do. Mm -hmm. God tells us to do one thing. We we do the edifying. We walk out our faith. We use our gifts. We grow in our sanctification. He builds the church. He brings the people in. He calls them by his spirit. They hear the gospel in whatever way. They end up in a congregation, mm -hmm. and we are responsible for building up and doing these things. But Christ builds his church. Yeah. Because I be worried about your soul. Why you still be doubting you got a soul? Like you need to see to believe these things. But you believe things that you've never seen. Like feelings and hopes and dreams. The future emotions and gravity. And sadly, everything you're rejecting makes this whole life a tragedy. And I got something to say. I got something to say. I got something to say to the world.